I just want to say thank you so much for being a part of this interview and um, sharing your information with our audience about living more of a healthy and holistic lifestyle. Oh, thank you for asking me. It's my pleasure. This has become a passion for me. And uh, I, I guess one of the things people wonder about is how I got into this in the first place. Mm -hmm. So when I was two, my pediatrician gave me an overdose of penicillin, which left me on the verge of death in the hospital. And they performed all kinds of things, spinal taps on my backbone and had many, many transfusions. And they told my parents I was going to die. But as you can see, I did pull through, but I was left with a severe case of acute anemia. So growing up, I started craving anything that would give me energy. And so sugar became my food of choice. And growing up back in the 50s and 50s and 60s, a lot of the food on the market at the time and the food that my mother and my parents were told to buy were like fortified white refined types of foods. And so even the white refined types of foods, your body reads like pure sugar and has to pull nutrients from it in order to process it. So by high school, I was told by my eye doctor that I was going blind and that he didn't see any way to stop it. And I don't know if they put two and two together back then, but I was also told I was pre-diabetic. So I, I know that uh, macular degeneration is a big problem with people with diabetes. So I, in my own opinion, think that those were combined and my doctors just weren't communicating with each other. At that time, my doctor told me that the synthetic sweeteners were a better choice for me. So sugar-free Dr. Pepper became my food of choice as I headed off to college and uh, moved to London and studied theater and Cordon Bleu. And as I continued uh, through my college years, my father had a heart attack. So I'm from Texas. And I grew up on a lot of meat-based foods and southern fried foods. And so, you know, there was always a large chunk of meat in, in the middle of our dining table. And being acute anemic and still struggling with that, and one of the things I did all the time was I chewed on ice chips. Mm -hmm. And a real indication that someone has... A severe iron deficiency as they chew on ice and anyway as I as I started having these um, artificial sweeteners and started drinking these kinds of sodas and I was still eating what was kind of mainstream Americanized type of food white refined breads and white refined types of things like pasta and rice and then vegetables but everybody was telling me since I was acute anemic that I needed to eat lots of meat and have lots of liver. Well, when my dad had a heart attack when I was in college, he survived. I had also lost previous relatives to heart disease. And so I got into my 20s and I got married and I got pregnant pretty, pretty quickly. And as I had gotten into my 20s, I had developed very severe headaches and carpal tunnel syndrome so bad that I had to wear braces on both of my wrists. And I got diagnosed with scoliosis. I was still pre-diabetic and I still had acute anemia. So that here I am, I had two babies back to back, 13 months apart. And I had not lost the weight I gained from the first baby when I got pregnant with the second. And so my doctor just told me, don't worry about your weight. He really didn't give me guidelines for eating. So he just said, eat. So I did. <laughs> and I ended up being about 50 pounds overweight when my second child was born. And for somebody that's five foot two, that was a lot of weight. Well, when my son was born, my father was diagnosed with cancer. And I will never forget the night I was standing over my son's bed, he was one, and my sister called me and told me my father had passed away. And I had just left his bedside, and I was racing home to see the children before going back. And I looked at my son, who was one, and 
I just realized he wasn't going to see his grandchildren grow up. And he was younger than I am, and I'm 63 now. He was 62 when he died. He, he didn't get to see our, his grandchildren grow up. And it occurred to me we were all going to the doctor, doing exactly what we were supposed to, taking what we were prescribed, but no one seemed to be getting well. And I wasn't getting well. And here I had two children at home and I wanted to raise him and I wanted to live and be healthy enough to enjoy my grandchildren. And it was about this time that my own gynecologist died of cancer. And I'm just looking at this big picture and I'm thinking, this, this really isn't working. There's something wrong here. I'm going to try something new. So I hired a new doctor, Dr. Jean Goss, who was just fabulous. And I told her, I said, I'm doing a new program. I'm going to use food as my medicine. <laughs> and I would just want you to take my blood once a year and tell me where I am. Because when I told people I was going to be a vegetarian and I was this person who had had an anemia all my life, I had to wear a bracelet that said uh, allergic to penicillin because uh, my mother was so afraid if I had gotten in an accident, you know, that's the first thing they'd give me and she thought it would kill me. And so I, uh, she said, Nancy, I did not learn anything about nutrition in medical school. So, you know, I'll certainly support you in this journey and we'll see what happens. And I, and I kind of said the same thing to my pediatrician. And it was about this time I got Life magazine and it had a very intensive, long, in-depth article on the new farming practices about how they were raising animals in these confined buildings that had no fresh air, no uh, sunshine, uh, no grass, no, no natural environment. And it was, they were giving them hormones to fatten them up faster. And because of the conditions being so unhealthy, they were having to give them lots of antibiotics in order just to keep them alive long enough for them to kill them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then had these huge graphic pictures of these sweet little animals being treated just like they weren't even living beings. Mm -hmm. And I'm a huge animal lover from, I think from birth, I just, I'm certified licensed wildlife rehabilitator now. But I just, I put down that article, I was so horrified by it, and I turned to my husband and I just said, I can't participate in this anymore, and I'm going to be vegetarian, I'm going to raise the children this way, and he said, okay. So I started in this journey using food as my medicine, switching to a plant-based diet, and I just had the doctors kind of working with me there. And at this time, I started learning about GMOs and how, and this was 30 years ago, yeah. I was learning about GMOs and how the flowers in the plants have no nectar. I don't know if you've ever noticed that when you go to a florist, he says, those flowers don't have any fragrance. Yeah. Well, these pollinators in our beautiful web of life, they were all dying from starvation because they weren't able to get any food from all these plants mm -hmm. and I found that so upsetting and distressful and so I started an organic garden I started growing heirloom plants I joined a seed exchange and I started making my own baby food mm -hmm. and 30 years ago there just wasn't a whole lot of choices for organic food or anything so I was just ordering from farmers I was doing the best I could well over the next year or two after I switched to this, that weight just fell off like, like it was nothing. And it was amazing because I didn't even have to try. My pre-diabetes vanished. My acute anemia, which really surprised everyone, including my doctor, disappeared. And I had my carpal tunnel syndrome went away and my headaches went away. I felt better than I had probably felt my whole life. And my pediatrician told me that I had the healthiest children he had ever seen. And so I knew that I was on the road to something. I was adding more plant-based foods to my diet. I was switching out unhealthy white refined flour for various other flours that I was researching. And, um, and now over the years, now that I'm 63, my kids are grown. I know a lot of people were worried my children would have stunted growth and be terribly unhealthy. And my son is six foot one. 
which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And they are both very healthy today. And my personal doctor, Jan, she retired about 15 years ago. And I haven't even bothered to get another doctor because I never get sick. And I never, I never need anything. And I really just went to her more because I like her and I wanted to see her. And then she really supported what I was doing. And she would send me a lot of her clients and put my, my information in her, her offices for her clients who needed nutritional counseling. And so anyway, um, yeah, I, I just never even worry or even think about getting sick or the flu or anything like that and I really do believe that it is the quality of the food that's important but also I have learned and, and through my research have found that the plant-based diet really is an excellent way to be healthy and have optimum health in your life. In all your research there's like vast amounts of information that I'm I'm still like learning every time I read part of your book there's like so much information that's so beneficial and I think that's what's so amazing about all this research you've done you've kind of lived it and you've also like practiced it and then now here you are like super healthy and can talk about all the benefits of everything um, and then with that is there any tips or advice you can give to like preparing food or like moving into that more of a healthy lifestyle if you eat especially if you eat like meat all the time and sure um i think one thing to really recognize is it's a combination of everything so i'm very holistic so it's body mind spirit it's your environment as well as the food you eat and i was married to an environmental trial lawyer for 23 years so i became very very knowledgeable about a lot of information that wasn't public knowledge because it was tied up in the courts so electromagnetic fields toxins in the air and the water cleaning products things like that so uh, what we put on our skin is just as important as what we put in our mouth because it goes straight to our bloodstream without getting you know, and having anything done to it. And so it can be just as toxic to us as something we eat. So some of the basic things I tell people <laughs> that I start off with is you know, don't drink your tap water if it's got chlorine and fluoride in it right. because that chlorine was the first chemical they developed for warfare to kill people and it will knock out your immune system immediately. So you want to, you want Want to get a filter to filter your water and if you can get one that will filter out the fluoride too which is a little harder to filter out the, the fluoride it isn't even if if it did work and it's proven it hasn't if it did work it's not even the right fluoride and it is a cumulative poison that will um, accumulate over time in your bones and it can cause osteosarcoma especially in little boys so um so so a key thing is to drink good quality water and if you have a well or a spring near you then that kind of water i think is can be one of the best because it is usually got minerals in it and water is a unique element and so it has a structure to it. And when you can get water from a natural source, that's always ideal. But if you can't, uh, just taking out the chlorine and fluoride is really, really helpful. I don't know if you've noticed, but the chapter in my book on water is extremely <laughs> comprehensive. And if anybody wants some tips on types of, types of bottled water or how to structure your water or various things like that, um, really all my books, the vegetarian book, the diabetes book, uh, the Raising Healthy Children's book, they all have really good uh, water information. And since we're 66 to 72 percent water and most chronic diseases caused from intercellular dehydration and, you know, focusing on that initially is a great place to start. I even, from that, it's like thinking about you should drink like half your weight in ounces. <laughs> that's ideal right that's so, ideal but, but you have to take into account like say it's get, getting into summer if you're eating a lot of things like watermelon that are you know got a whole lot of water in them then you're you, you can count that as as part of your water too 
Okay, so you started this like 30 years ago when this whole vegan movement or change wasn't even like a thing. So can you talk a little bit about how you've seen, you know, the consciousness change or just the idea of, you know, eating raw and veg vegetables? Um, you're so right. 30 years ago when I went vegetarian, it was, it seemed so extreme in Dallas, Texas back then. I literally had people yell at me across the table that I was evil. <laughs> Not kidding you. And, and I would have to call restaurants sometimes two or three days ahead of time or clubs we were members of two or three days ahead of time and talk to the chef and find out, you know, what they could make for me that didn't have lard in it or didn't have bacon in it or didn't have chicken broth in it or, I mean, it was really quite remarkable how many restaurants in, and really how many are still in Dallas today that I'll go in and they'll have lard and everything, which is animal fat or chicken broth and everything. Mm -hmm. And, and I just have to ask them, just like I ask if there's monosodium glutinate in the food. <laughs> I have to ask them if there's something uh, that I can eat. But it has gotten so much easier and so much more acceptable. And I think so much of it is because of all the research that's been done over the last 30 years that shows that a plant-based diet can reverse heart disease and reverse the effects and reverse diabetes and also uh, reverse and help prevent cancers. So, you know, that I think has gone to support it. And with half the people in the U.S. today having chronic disease, I know a lot of people come to me for health counseling who've had quintuple, quintuple triple heart bypass surgery or they're in stage four cancer and given two months to live. And I will tell you, if people do change their diet and stick to it, it's amazing that the body's incredible and they, it can miraculous things can happen. Well, you know, it's really funny is this weekend I went to a reunion for the TV show Dallas. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that one, but it had JR on it with Larry Hagman and Linda Gray as Sue Allen Yoon. And I was Larry Hagman's nutritionist and chef when he was struggling with diabetes and cancer. And so I worked with him on his diet, but he had also chosen to do radiation and chemotherapy. And so I was just working in conjunction with what his choices were. And so um, he was such a dear friend of mine. And so I went to this reunion and we went to the Longhorn Ballroom, which is a big old Western place where they have live music and it was really great a few years ago you would never have been able to get a vegetarian meal there yeah. but they had vegetarian meals there the other night that were very very good and gluten-free and um, anyway it was it was so nice to be able to go somewhere like that and be able to eat food most of the time in the last 30 years, I would literally eat before I went or take food with me. And I'm not kidding you. Um, just so that I, I wouldn't be hungry. I think it's great that you've been holding this information and like the, the energy behind it about like this healthy way to live your life. Cause now people are starting to do that. One of, one of the things people ask me about frequently when they're wanting to eat a more plant-based diet, and many times they don't want to be a hundred percent vegetarian. And I tell them that's okay. And I know you were asking, you know, what do people do if they have more of a meat-based diet? Well, there, there was a recent study of 6,000 people between the ages of 50 and 65 uh, across the U S comprehensive study. And in this study, they found that people who had the highest amount of creature protein intake, and so that would include dairy, it would include um, eggs, chicken, fish, beef, any any of the what I call creature proteins. Because a lot of times you say meat, and people just think beef, and they don't realize that chicken and fish are also considered, you know, a meat. But but dairy, eggs, chicken, fish, all of those creature proteins, they act very differently in our body. And what they found in the surveys that people with the highest amount of protein intake from creatures were 75% more likely to die of any disease. 
times. Four times more likely to die of cancer and five times more likely to die of diabetes. But if, if the people had a high intake of protein from plants, it was the complete opposite. They were 75% less likely to die of any disease. Mm -hmm. And so what I've, I've found from my research is that it's not protein that people are needing. It's the complex amino acids. And plants are readily available with these complex amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. And your body can utilize that right away. When it's creature protein, your body quite literally has to work really hard to transform that protein into the complex amino acids that your body needs to, to function properly. Your body doesn't need protein like we've all been brainwashed over the last 50 years in, in the world to believe that it really is, it's those building blocks that we need. And so now I'm, I'm seeing people who have depression or different, different health problems and they're getting complex amino acid treatments. And, and that just makes so much sense to me because if they are eating a high creature protein diet, they're not getting enough of the various complex amino acids that can prevent depression or, or things like that. Uh, one of the things I know has been a really big problem is the depression in this country, and so many people are on antidepressant drugs. But uh, there's one complex amino acid that's 5-HTP, 5 and then H, T, and P. And that's a great a supplement that you can take that can literally lift your mood and, and help you feel better. And so that's, uh, L-theanine is another one of those. And uh, those, are, those are very, very helpful. But also, I think, like, when I met Larry Hagman, he had been trying to eat a vegetarian diet to help reverse his cancer. And he said, you know, I'm just starving to death. I, I just don't feel like I'm getting enough food. And then one reason I wrote my book, um, How to Be a Healthy Vegetarian, was simply because I had so many people coming up to me saying, you know, I used to be a vegetarian, but I just couldn't do it anymore. I just felt hungry. I just didn't feel like I had enough energy. So one of the reasons I wrote my book is that I, I felt like I had really figured out how to be a healthy vegetarian. I'm an O blood type. My daughter's an O blood type. I know there really hasn't been the in-depth research on the blood types types of things, but according to them, I would be 100% meat eater. Yeah. And yet I thrive on a plant-based diet. And, but I do know how to prepare the proteins properly so that they don't cause gas and they don't have the phytic acid in them that can block your body from absorbing nutrients. And so in my recipes, I don't know if you noticed this, but I do the steps on how to get rid of the phytic acid, how to remove the enzyme inhibitors in plant-based foods so that you can digest them more effectively and they taste better. <laughs> and, then, and then they also work better in your body that way. I think really over the last 50 years, we were the meat industry and the dairy industry. They were just so huge with their lobbying groups. They just convinced us we needed all of this animal protein but yet you know if you can prepare them properly and I think also people really just didn't know how to prepare them properly and you go to eat out at a restaurant and you're not removing the phytic acid from their beans or their lentils or things and they may be harder to digest so um, I think um, just having more of the protein carbohydrate and fat in your diet is a way to feel more satisfied. And in all my recipes, I, I include that information and how to do that. And the fat actually tells your body how to use the, the proteins and the carbohydrates. So it's really important to have that whole symphony of foods in your diet so that they can work synergistically. And I, I think that's one of the best ways to, to have a, a healthier uh, vegetarian diet or vegan diet and then also if you're ever doing a recipe where you are it calls for meat or some kind of creature protein substitute mushrooms for that 
because mushrooms are incredibly helpful for you. And in fact, a university in Australia did a study that found that people who ate fresh mushrooms every day had a 65% less chance of getting cancer. And that's, that's pretty impressive. And they said also if you add green tea to drinking, you know, drink some green tea every day, then it went up to like 90% prevention of cancer. So, you know, just some simple little things like that that can be really delicious are an easy way to do that. And the mushrooms can give you that little meaty kind of flavor that you might be craving when you're trying to switch. And also they can be grilled. And I know a lot of people like to get out and grill on holidays and they think, what am I going to have when they're all having hamburgers and hot dogs and take a big portobello mushroom with you and have that. And it's, um, it's really makes a great hamburger. With all this information, you talked about proteins and how you uh, prepare. How did you learn all that? Like, was it just trial and error or learning from chefs? Or like, what exactly um, got you to where this research that you're talking about? What's interesting is I, I had actually studied quite a few things as a chef in my young youth. And then as I grew older, and especially when I started researching nutrition, I just continued on that. And I'm trying to remember where I learned that, but I stumbled upon it in something and I knew, and I've been doing this extinct, kind of instinctively for the last 30 years. I'm like, you know, I'm not digesting these beans or, or these lentils properly, and how can I make it better? And so I would like soak them and sprout them before I cook them, which is really what removes the enzyme inhibitors and also can make it um, have less of the phytic acid. But I was also boiling them, bringing them to a boil, and then pouring off all the water and then boiling them again. So I was breaking it down so it was more digestible. Mm -hmm. If you really sprout them well, though, you don't have to boil, bring them to a boil and off the water and, and do that twice because that can be a lot of extra work and so my books kind of tell you an easier way to do it that's not quite so time consuming but also I think adding combinations of things like uh, the right kind of salt to your diet and the right kind of fat and also to these recipes uh, makes a big difference in how your body's able to digest them properly and as I started researching just different things about plant-based foods and then taking more classes on the healing diet of eating plant-based foods, it just all started coming together and making sense for me. Well, I just want to say thank you for doing all that research because like in your books, it's like, it's amazing all the info and how clear and like uh, the recipes are so beneficial. If you'd like to talk about how you prepare foods for your kids and how, um, how that has helped you to, you know, um, raise your kids in such a healthy way. Thank you. I think every mom wants to raise healthy kids. And that was definitely very keen in my mind right when my dad passed away and I was struggling with all those health issues. And I thought, I really don't want my children to experience that. And so I started making my own baby food, using organic food, and using non-chlorinated water. So my kids grew up eating, you know, avocado mashed up as one of their meals or sweet potatoes just mashed up, you know, as a meal. And so what happens is our taste buds acclimate to what we have are having. And so if your child is, for instance, getting formula that has a lot of sugar in it, then that baby's taste buds are going to acclimate to that. If you're giving them white refined cereals or things that have high amounts of sugar in it, that's what their, their taste buds acclimate for. If you're going to fast food restaurants, there's lots of MSG and chemicals in that food and it becomes addictive and it causes brain damage. And so, you know, how do you get kids off of that kind of thing is you, you slowly start weaning them off of it and giving them healthier foods. And 
it, it's quite remarkable how children respond very quickly to a cleaner diet. Uh, I was a school teacher when I first got out of college, and I taught at a school for children with learning differences like dyslexia. And the school's policy really seriously was to have every single one of those children on drugs. And in my opinion, I, I disagreed with that. And I thought there's, there's some reason these children are having this problem. I thought, well, number one, they're not meant to sit in a chair all day long in a enclosed classroom trying to remember stuff. You know, we should run around the block between every class and let them get exercise, fresh air, and sunshine. And, you know, kids really should be doing that. But also the research has shown that these chemicals added to food, like the colorings and the dyes, if you take this out of a child's diet, the ADHD and a lot of these learning problems quite literally improve or even disappear and children are remarkably better behaved and able to think clearer when they're not on drugs. I also think when we give kids drugs, you're number one, you're telling them that there's something wrong with them, which I think is very harmful to their subconscious. And then it's also telling them that drugs solve your problem. Even if you're telling your children not to do drugs and you're giving them drugs, you know, in, in their minds, what's the difference, right. you know? And so do drugs, you know, really solve your problems? Well, you know, I would, I would debate that and I would say no. And I would like to address it in a healthy uh, dietary way and also lifestyle with more, you know, fresh air, sunshine and exercise. So, you know, raising your children, they also, they don't listen to you very well. <laughs> but they'll watch what you're doing and they're going to end up doing what you're doing. And if you're drinking Coca-Cola and eating fast food donuts and things like that, that's what they're going to want to do because they want to be like their parents. But if you're eating salads and you're making your own food and my kids grew up, helping me make the meals and helping me make the homemade bread and the homemade cookies or pastas using whole grain, organic, like garbanzo bean flour, things like that. And so their taste buds acclimated for that and their, their bodies were used to that. And so that was just something that they were, that they were just, uh, that was just a part of their lives. But I did not act like the food police. So when they were off with their friends and things, it really was up to them what they were going to do. And I think also if we, if we make, you know, really strict guidelines on kids, sometimes they just want to revolt and rebel. I mean, just out of, out of, <laughs> you know, renegadeness or something. But uh, I think if you give them a choice, in the end, they, they'll come back to what's really good for them because that is really what is going to serve their body and their body's going to really crave that. And, um, and so anyway, I think one of, one of my tricks that I did, or I don't know if it was a trick, it was really more of a, just a fun thing I thought of, and I would have our family do it, is as the kids are growing up, I found that they're more likely to eat different foods if they help prepare them. So I would get them involved. And so I'd have like a, a meal every once in a while where everyone had to pick a dish and we had to, you know, tell each other so that nobody picked the same one. And so somebody would pick a salad, somebody would pick a, you know, side dish or a main dish. And, you know, quite ev inevitably my son would always pick something like carrots, you know, steamed carrots or something. But then we'd all go to the store and we, get our ingredients. So my kids learned to grocery shop. They learned to look for, you know, quality of carrots or sweet potatoes or how to pick out a mushroom. And then we would all go home and we would prepare the food together, which was really fun. And, and then the, that was for some of the best meals we had because each person had contributed and, and that can be such a great activity around around something like that and, and I think just learning how to cook makes you appreciate all the stuff that you're actually putting into your body and like what you're doing with it 
how you're preparing it and how you're gonna it's gonna make you feel like when you eat it once you've done it it's just like so satisfying rather than just ordering delivery chewing it all down and then feeling like not that great you know i think there's a huge difference when you do that and i think it benefits when you you know like you do all the work yeah and he didn't love to eat <laughs> yeah I really do believe that there is a lot of energy involved in our health and everything is about energy. And so I can feel when you're making food and you know, your grandmother's food always tasted better because she was yeah. making it for you, right? She put all that love in it. So I really do believe that love should always be the main ingredient. And I also love how you, th th uh, you wrote on your book, how like the first year, um, uh, with your baby or your child like that's one of the most important years to like for them to experience and to sense things and be introduced to all those things and um i think if people thought more like that they'd be a lot more conscious about what they eat you know you know the minute our children are born they're immediately connected to us with food and so food is our comfort that is what makes us feel safe and loved. And that's why all our celebrations are around food and the table and family and our friends. And so it, it is something we turn to when we're having a bad day. We'll go, you know, grab that, that thing that reminds us of, of our childhood and, and feeling that unconditional love from our mother or our father or our family or our friends or whoever whoever you happen to have at the time right. and and so one of the things i work with with people today is trying to change what comfort food they want i was with a man yesterday doing a grocery store walk through and he's just got a horrible health problems he's very much overweight and he's like i can't give up my ice cream what am i going to do about candy I and i was just you know, <laughs> like okay this is what we're going to do. And so, okay, big tip here. <laughs> if you're a real candy craver, one of the things that I think is a better alternative so you don't feel deprived is get some really good organic dates, D-A-T-E-S. Those, It's a fruit. And a lot of people from around the world probably haven't tried them, but they're usually grown in the Middle East. I think they're grown in a few other parts of the world, but it's a wonderful Middle Eastern kind of Mediterranean food that is very sweet, but it's also packed with vitamins and minerals and nutrients. And that's what I have when I'm craving something sweet is I'll have a, just a plain old dried date, one that has not had any added sugar added to it. And I just chew it really slowly. And I think that's it. also a key is we need to just stop gulping stuff down or eating while we're running for, you know, a class or, you know, eating with food coming in through our window in our car. We need to like sit down and have a meal <laughs> or just chew our food and really enjoy it and savor it. And I think in many ways that can benefit some people's health more than anything. A lot of people I run into, and, and this may not necessarily be a transition, but a lot of people have been told um, to cut out their salt or to not eat salt. And our bodies will are, are, are meant to have those minerals in it. In fact, have you ever heard the word electrolyte? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is quite literally a fancy medical term for the word salt. Wow. So salt is and has historically been more valuable than gold mm -hmm. because we will quite literally die without it. One of the things I hear very commonly now is, oh, no, I don't eat any salt. I don't have any salt in my diet. You know, I have high blood pressure and I can't have any salt. Well, since they don't teach nutrition in medical school, the doctors don't understand that there's a difference between white refined salt that has had all the electrolytes taken out of it mm -hmm. and high fructose corn syrup added to it and preservatives added to it 
And then they add a little bit of iodine to that and tell you that, you know, you should take it for the iodine. But the iodine dissipates when it hits oxygen, so it's really not even an effective way of getting iodine. Anyway, the first thing I tell people when I'm helping them transition to a healthier diet is to throw out all the white salt. <laughs> Just throw it in the trash. Your body quite literally reads that like a poison. And it's not what I call real salt. Real salt, in my opinion, is unrefined mineral rich salt. And when you start adding that to your diet, and uh, adults should probably have at least a teaspoon a day. And of course, if you're eating fast food or processed foods, those probably have white salt in them. And yes, those, that's not good. And so that's another reason to start making your own food and not buying processed things out of a box or out through a window. But without salt in our diet, we will quite literally die. Our immune system can't function, our adrenal glands can't function, and our thyroid cannot function. And so historically, Napoleon's army died coming back from Russia because they had no salt. During the Revolutionary War, the British tried to defeat Washington's army by stealing their salt. Wow. And there was, people ask me, but I have high blood pressure, I can't have salt. Well, there was a study in the Netherlands that took a, people with, took a big group of people, both sexes, all ages, and they, they took a people, this group of high blood pressure people and took half of them off their medication. And what they did is they said, instead of eating white refined salt, we want you to have mineral rich salt. It's the only thing they changed in their diet, mm -hmm. except taking them off their medication. And at the end of the study, they found that the people who were not on the medication, but were, had just changed one ingredient in their diet, had as good a blood pressure as the people on the medication. And then of course they didn't have to deal with any of the negative side effects of the medication. And so, you know, I think it, that is very telling. Mm -hmm. And so these minerals are so important for our body. And I think most people are very mineral deficient. And so I tend to prefer the salts like the Bolivian rose sea salt, which is what I use personally, because it has natural amounts of iodine in it that support your thyroid. And so we need to have iodine in our diet in a natural food form and so that's a great way for for you to get that and that's the way i get mine but i add it to my water i add it to my food i carry it with me wherever i go and it has an antihistamine effect in fact so many people today have like allergy problems yeah. and i just tell them here have a little bit of my salt yeah. get it under your tongue and they will <laughs> and all of a sudden they like clear up and they're like oh my goodness it just it is they have been mineral deficient, so they're getting all of these problems. So I tell people, in fact, this is what I do in the morning, is I gargle with uh, salt in my water, and, um, and I also drink a big glass of water that has some um, of the Bolivian red sea salt in it, and that's how I hydrate. And without these electrolytes, or the, the salt, right, our body can't absorb the water so with our body being 66 to 72 percent water mm -hmm. we need to, we need to absorb that and so without those electrolytes you can't absorb the water and your body would be pulling minerals from your body in order to process that water mm -hmm. so it helps you hydrate and so many things so you know i think um quality is important but also the the water and salt and just adding more vegetables to your diet those are like my three top key things that I think are so virtually important. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. And what about uh, pink Himalayan salt? I know that's like a huge thing in New York. Everyone has that, like in restaurants and stuff like that. that right, and it's, and it's really good. It has a lot of minerals in it. It doesn't have the iodine in it, though. Having studied the salts extensively, I prefer um, the others. It's not that I wouldn't use Himalayan and then if, if I'm at a restaurant and they actually have that offered and I forgot to carry my own in my purse. <laughs> but I just, um, uh, also there's another one in Utah that is mined that also has some natural 
iodine in it, and the brand name of that one is Real, R-E-A-L. But I know that company also sells Himalayan, so you need to check on their bottle and make sure it's the one that's mined in Utah. And so these old salts that are mined, those are oceans that were before pollution, really. So the one in Bolivia was an old ocean before pollution when the land still, Earth still had a, a lot of iodine in it. And then it was sealed off by volcanoes, so that's why they mine it. But the, the waters today are pretty polluted. They've got plastic and they've got mercury and they've got radiation from the nuclear disasters. And so I prefer to use these old mine salts that are free of all that pollution and more mineral rich than the salts from the oceans today that can have, you know, those various components in them that you may not know about. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. I mean, you're the expert, so I'm totally going <laughs> to follow everything that you say. <laughs> so that's great. No, that's just, I didn't even know about some of that info. So this is really, really um, eye-opening and really cool. Is there anything that you want to leave with besides, um, you know, that people can purchase your books and they can read more about your research and everything that you've been doing for the past 30 years? Um, is there anything else um, that they can reach you or get in contact with you if there's anything they want to know more about? Thank you so much. Uh, it's been such a blessing to be on your show. I'm very grateful to Marina for connecting us and for, for her and for your message as well. Um, one of the things I have really put in my books is a, a lot of love, but also um, there, you know, the How to Be Healthy Vegetarians Index, so you can look up things easily. It's got resources in the back, a lot of recipes for non-toxifying your home, how to grocery store shop, also a lot of resources like where you can find things if you if you need to. And uh, I made diabetes in your diet a little shorter. I was trying trying to work towards smaller books because you know people don't always want the encyclopedia. <laughs> but oh, okay. but uh, but I. I really do. My, my website's organichealthylife.com, so if you want to contact me, you can do it there. But I really do believe that when you give the body the right tools, it can do miraculous things, and that it does take that choice of wanting to do it and choosing that for yourself and loving yourself enough to make those changes in order for you to have radiant health from the inside out. And I really think it's possible regardless of, of your income. I think there are ways to do it. And I hope I put in my book uh, uh, enough information that allows people to be able to find things wherever they are in the world mm -hmm. and, um, and, and make it work for them. And I do think a vegetarian diet can be very cost effective and easy and uh and delicious i do think healthy eating can be delicious <laughs> yeah i know with your books especially there's so many options and so many healthier ways to think about what you can choose to eat and prepare i think it's gonna really really help people and how they um grocery shop and either go to a farmer's market i'm doing that more um and I think everyone's just learning how empowering it is to you to like, you know, be a lot more conscious of what you put in your body. Yeah, I'd love to hear from people if they, if they have a question or a suggestion or, or anything like that. And I always love hearing from people from around the world on, on what's going on with them. And, uh, I'm so excited for your new books. So do you want to give any info about that or? Sure. Well, I'm doing one on organic gardening and then another one on the healing diet. And I actually taught classes on the healing diet for Dr. Michael Hall at Parker University for chiropractors for five years. And that is basically on the plant-based diet and how it can help reverse disease and how to best go about that. And, of course, a lot of that is really in my book. That's one reason I wrote it was Diabetes in Your Diet. and I was literally encouraged to, to write that book by someone who is on the board of a large medical normal medical facility here in Dallas and um, 
So that was you know, very encouraging because uh, some of my clients are doctors and people who are on these medical boards. And, uh, and so they're, they're finding that nutrition can really help and, and they weren't taught this in school. And so uh, I think one reason my information is different is because I didn't just go to school and learn nutrition. And I didn't just go and learn chef, how to be a chef. I, I really combined everything, including the environment. And I didn't just take nutrition, but I, I took various components of, of nutrition, including plant-based nutrition at Cornell. And, and I just started putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And so I think I've come up with a more comprehensive way to look at it but also how the, all the pieces fit together and how to do it easily and make it easy to understand i think over the years they've tried to make it so complicated that, the, that you had to go pay somebody to learn how to eat and i like to think that my books give you the tools to take control of your life and and i i like to think you graduate and you know you're able to make those better decisions no matter where you are whether you're traveling or you're at the grocery store or at a restaurant and you can think okay nancy said this mm -hmm. and i've got these choices so i'm going to choose this one and and it is empowering and when you can do that and know you know what is a what is a better decision because we aren't always given perfect decisions to make you know, you've got great and great. Well, you know, those are easy, but <laughs> we don't always get those. Yeah. I think this is so cool because in the future, my girlfriend and I, we always have this dream or fantasy to have like this farm to table kind of restaurant that um, it would also be a rescue for animals. And so like if people wanted to go heal or like, you know, learn how to grow food, they could farm and then have a community where you can cook, but then also like heal yourself with like, you know, these rescue animals. Um, well, I want to be a part of that. Yeah. So, this is, <laughs> so like finding out about your thing, your, about you and then your books, it's just like, it's just so cool. Cause it makes me feel that like this could actually happen and I'm meeting people that are going to, you know, help me and like, yeah, I would love to have you be a part of that. I feel like you would bring so much to the table and, um, I'm excited what this is going to do for people to think about. Yeah, and there's a new kind of farming that, uh, well, and I love uh, permaculture, but there's also another kind of farming where you don't till the soil at all. Mm. And apparently it is much more natural and easier on the ground and on the plants. And so I'm starting to learn a little bit more about that as well. But uh, I, do, I do think anybody can grow a little bit of their own food regardless of where they are, even if they're in a small Manhattan apartment, yeah. um, even if it's just sprouts or something. But um, yeah, and I think it's very empowering to have control over at least something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there a big community in Dallas that you work with and like talk about all these things? Or how do you even like, yeah, get access to all this? Yeah, I, I, I'm a, a member of the International uh, National Speakers Association. So I've been going around the world speaking on this for, uh, I don't know, since 2007, I guess, 2008. And I, uh, you know, I just, people just contact me and I, I go and meet with them. I've, I, I, I'm actually in New York quite often uh, on TV or uh, doing different things up there. I was helping with the farmer's markets in the, the food desert areas, of, mm -hmm. like in the Bronx and things, trying to promote that mm -hmm. and get those going. And they started giving food, uh, food, fresh food for food stamps. And if they would pay with their food stamps $5 for like fresh greens, they would get a $2 coupon back. So it was encouraging people who were less educated and, and probably eating a higher diet of high fructose corn syrup related processed foods for eating fresh food. And it's really taken off. It started out with one farmer's market and now there's like five yeah. and in those inner city areas. And, um, uh, but yeah, I've been up in Canada and South Africa and France and Brazil mm -hmm. and Nicaragua and, uh, but anyway, it's just, this is my passion. I love sharing this information with people. So, yeah, 
and I've dreamed of having a center where I could, you know, teach, teach all this and have people stay there and experience the healthy diet for a week or so and learn all the things about it, you know, maybe in a month and have the animals there as well. Like you were envisioning, I mean, it just, uh, it sounds like we have a very similar vision in some ways and I, I'm so happy to connect with someone that, uh, Definitely. really feels the same way about some things as I do. Well, thank you again so much. It was such a pleasure meeting you, and thank you again. So, thank you, thank you. so lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you, too. Okay.